Okay. okay. So we have the Windows machine learning team is coming over and they're gonna talk about WinML. Um, okay. Welcome. About that. Um, you know, we have a lot of these great technologies for being able to train in the cloud. Um, so we have Azure Machine Learning that allows mm -hmm. you to consume data and train models. Uh, you know, we have toolkits like and CNTK that allow you to do model training. Uh, but what we really want to light up here is the ability for a developer on a machine that doesn't have internet and scenarios that might require super quick results to be able to do model evaluation on the client mm -hmm. without requiring the cloud. So to do that, we've created this API called Windows Machine Learning. Uh, to be able to hardware accelerate model evaluation on your machine. So Windows Machine Learning is actually available to the developer as a developer preview in our next release in both a Win32 API and a UWP, uh, C Sharp, C++, and JavaScript API. Windows ML is actually available on all SKUs of Windows. And the cool thing is if you have a DirectX 12 GPU mm -hmm. on any machine, we will be able to use that GPU to hardware accelerate model evaluation. Cool. What if I don't have a DirectX GPU? Uh, so if all you have is a CPU on machine mm -hmm. or you don't have a DirectX 12 GPU, we will be able to do model evaluation on the CPU as well. Yeah, it's just be a little bit slower, but it still works, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. You know, the advantages of being able to do uh, local client-side model evaluation mm -hmm. are for scenarios that really require a super quick result, mm -hmm. uh, you just can't afford the round trip cost at a cloud. So yeah. you want to do that evaluation on the client. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there's going to be scenarios that, you know, you just need to be able to send some data back to the cloud, but sending all the data back to the cloud is just going to be cost prohibitive. So you may want to be able to do some sort of predictive analysis on that data before you send it back to the cloud. And then having client-side machine learning affordances really helps sort of reduce the amount of stuff you have to send back off to okay. the cloud. And lastly, if you're worried about any of that data uh, moving to the cloud due to privacy concerns or regulatory mm -hmm. concerns, uh, doing client-side model evaluation allows you to get an answer without having to depend on the cloud for that answer. And I presume that my model is going to become more intelligent over time based on some training data. So uh, I, I can train my model in the cloud, I can consume it, uh, I, can, I can deploy and consume it on the client, and then I guess I could build some kind of custom mechanism there for feeding data back up to the cloud to retrain and, and optimize. Yeah, exactly. Model. So how do we get started? You tell me. <laughs> no, how do we get started? Oh, okay. Well, how do we get started? Let's get straight into it. Uh, cool. So what we're going to show you guys today is I have a little bit of a sample app that you can actually get from our GitHub. Um, and what this app will allow you to do as a developer is it shows a little bit of UI that uses the XAML in Canvas control. And a user can actually use their finger or a pen to draw a digit into the in Canvas yeah. control. And what we're going to show you is how to take an image from that control and then pipe it through to a machine learning model and actually evaluate what sort of digit mm -hmm. a user has drawn. So we'll just get started uh, by looking at the app. And right now, if I hit F5. So we're just using the latest SDK here, latest version of Windows. Yeah, so this is uh, the latest version of Windows. Uh, inside of it, you have Windows Machine Learning APIs as a developer preview. Uh, everything else is just pretty much stock example. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, I have my app. I can draw uh, the number eight. And right now, if I click recognize, nothing happens. But what we're going to do is actually add a little bit of code that uses Windows yeah. Machine Learning to add an eight over here, or whatever the model thinks the digit is. It's a beautiful UI, though, i got to admit. It's very, very uh, <laughs> utilitarian. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add our namespace to the application. And you'll note that uh, our APIs right now are in preview for the next major release. One of the cool things that we did uh, in this release of Windows is we wanted to make it as easy as possible for developers to get started. The way we went about that is twofold. One, we realized that developers really need like a common model format to actually party on. Because right now, there's a lot of different training frameworks out there. All of them produce different types of uh, model formats. And trying to figure out how to take a model format produced by one training framework and actually use it in your application is pretty hard. So we worked with uh, the open source community to uh, standardize on a format called Onyx, 
-hmm. So if you go to onyx.ai, you can actually learn more about that project and sort of all the features that the Onyx model format support. So we wanted to make it really easy for developers to be able to add their Onyx files to Visual Studio and get started with Windows ML mm -hmm. really, really quickly. And one of the ways we've done that is if I go ahead and actually add an Onyx file as an asset to my application, one of the things Visual Studio will do is automatically generate some code for me uh, to get my application ready to call Windows ML without me even having to write very, very much code to actually interact mm -hmm. with Windows ML yet. So what you'll notice is as soon as I added this Onyx file to my uh, project, uh, Visual Studio actually ended up generating this uh, other file called mnist.cs. And the name actually corresponds to the model that I just loaded. Yeah. I just loaded mnist.onyx. And I'll have a quick run through this uh, CS file. Uh, and this is all code that you could have really written yourself if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But we just wanted to make sure that as soon as you add a model, it's super easy for you to use Windows ML. So we just wrote it for you. Uh, but looking through this file, like you'll kind of just notice sort of the calling pattern that we generally have Windows ML, which is that you first load a model, you then bind some inputs and outputs to that model based on what the model file was actually asking for, and then you call evaluation. So this generated code went ahead and did that. It created some uh, name properties uh, for inputs that correspond to the name uh, inputs that the model is expecting. Mm -hmm. It created uh, some classes to handle the outputs of prediction uh, that we'll get when we actually evaluate the model. And then it wrote some uh, code to kind of glue it all together to allow us to load the model file and call evaluation with those inputs. So where, where did you get this MNIST Onyx file from in the first place? Is, is this something I could go and pull out from the web or? So there's actually several different places you can get uh, Onyx model files from. So Onyx being an industry standard is now starting to get adopted by training frameworks. Mm -hmm. So if you actually want to train your own model, let's say on the MNIST data set, you can use things like Azure Machine Learning and other training frameworks to produce an Onyx file. Uh, another way to get an Onyx model file is, you know, there's, there's various open source uh, repositories that have models either already in the Onyx format mm -hmm. or in other formats. And for some of those other formats, we actually do offer conversion tools in order to be able to convert those models into Onyx. Now that we've added the Onyx file to our project and Visual Studio has kicked off some automatic code generation, we're going to get started by actually adding some of the logic to glue the model to our application. And I'm going to start instantiating some of the new classes that uh, Visual Studio just created. I'm going to create MNIST model. I'm going to create another file for the inputs. And I'll instantiate the last class that was generated that will store our outputs. So all three classes were generated just by putting that model into my project. Yeah, so the cool thing is uh, that generated code automatically opened up the model to see what sort of inputs it was mm -hmm. expecting and it created the corresponding properties on your behalf. It did the same thing for the outputs as well. So it saved you all that time of having to crack mm -hmm. open the model file and just created the properties for you. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And if you're writing a UWP in either C Sharp or C++, you will have that affordance. Cool. So. Where we are right now is we instantiated uh, some of the classes that the automatic code generation created, and we're actually ready to start hooking up uh, sort of the image input that we're going to get from that in Canvas when mm -hmm. a user draws a digit mm -hmm. up to uh, the generated classes uh, that we'll be calling into Windows ML. So we already have this really handy uh, recognize button click event handler, and mm -hmm. I already have some code here that I've commented out. And this is just your standard UWP, how you mm -hmm. load a file from an app resource uh, call. So I'll just go ahead and comment that out. And one of the things you'll note is that the uh, format of the file that we have to give into Windows ML is a storage file. Yeah. So we're using a resource like we would any other. Uh, so now that we have that storage file, I'll use some of the methods that we have off the generated classes mm -hmm. to actually start connecting that file to Windows ML. So I previously had a model gen class that I instantiated. And now I'm actually going to load the model. So there's a static method that the generated code produced called create MNIST model. And I'm going to feed it the storage file that we had just uh, called. And this is all asynchronous, right? So I, yeah. I could wait on this, and it's not going to um, exactly. block and so on. Okay. So I will just add an await here. And the cool thing is you can use Windows ML with your application. Mm -hmm. While you're doing model evaluation, your UI is still going to be fluid right. uh, because cool. we're all asynchronous. Okay. So now that I've actually loaded the model file with Windows ML, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is see what inputs the model is expecting. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, generated classes that I instantiated was something called model input. And when I examine that class, I'll notice that there is a property named uh, input3. 
And input three is actually one of the name properties that was within the model that the generator code uh, hooked up for me to be able to provide uh, input two. And I noticed that the input that it's expecting is a video frame. Now, one of the cool things about Windows ML is when you're working with image models, usually there's a lot of work required for you to massage whatever the image data type that you're working with into sort of the input format that the model is expecting. Mm -hmm. So Windows ML has abstracted all of that away for you and we use video frame as the currency of data exchange between sort of the UI layer and what the model's expecting. So I'm gonna start uh, hooking up that input. And one of the ways I can do that is we actually have a helper method that we included with the sample code that allows us to take the image from that canvas uh, mm -hmm. in canvas control and convert into a video frame. Now that I've hooked up uh, the ink canvas uh, as a video frame into the input for my model, the next thing I'm going to do is just try and evaluate the model and get an output. Okay. So I actually have uh, instantiated previously a model output class from the generated code. And once again, I will use an asynchronous method uh, on model gen to evaluate the model. And the input into that evaluation is the input uh, that I had previously just hooked up. And at this point, you've actually written all the code you need to be able to uh, load a model, to uh, bind inputs and outputs to that model, and to mm -hmm. call evaluation. So really, the next thing to do right now is to actually handle the evaluation results from that model. So the, the code that you generated is taking care of all that, that binding for me. It's taking the, the input, the video frame that I'm passing in here, and it's kind of hooking that up internally for me, so I don't have to do that myself. Yeah, exactly. So it saved you a bunch of time from having to examine the model, seeing what inputs it uh, required, seeing what outputs the model is going to give, creating sort of the various list structures that mm -hmm. correspond to those. Uh, it just did all that for you. I know with this particular model, the output of it is uh, basically a prediction of what is the digit that the user just had drawn on the screen. So I know this particular model gives me a list of about 10 indices corresponding to every single digit that mm -hmm. could have been drawn between 0 to 9. And at each one of those indices, there's a probability for what the user could have drawn. Mm -hmm. So I actually have some code already that basically grabs that output and sort of sorts through what is the highest probability and hooks up that probability for that index to our UI. Right. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste that in there. Uh, and now I'm going to hit F5. Magic is going to happen. And I'll ask one of you guys to uh, help me out by drawing a digit. Yes, OK. Eight. That is a terrible nine. Right, though. That can I, can go. I, yeah, go on. So I will draw what I believe is a three. Yeah. Okay. I, and I the machine like I does think it is a three. I don't. I don't believe any of you. So I need to come in and just test this myself first. So let's do a one. That oh is indeed God. a one. Go. It could yeah. be a seven. So as you can see, like, oh, seven. Okay. No, it could be a seven. <laughs> I'm saying what he drew. This guy's always trying to break two. things. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Did you used to be what a kind tester? Of developer are you? <laughs> Lucky number seven. Uh, but the cool thing about this is, you know, to actually operationalize that model within your yeah. application didn't take that much effort. No. All you really needed to do was uh, add that model to your project, start using some of the generated classes, hook up some inputs, call eval, and a two is a two. And you could cut the internet connection here. You've gone into flight mode, and this is just going to continue to work. Oh, yeah. You don't need internet for this. This is all client side. The cool yeah. thing is, if your machine has a DirectX 12 GPU, we will use uh, GPU for hardware acceleration okay, of this evaluation, uh, but no internet required. Very cool. That's really cool. And I notice you're instantiating the model every time you click the recognize button. That's not necessary, right? I could instantiate it somewhere outside and have an instance of that. Yeah, totally. It. Actually, okay. just for the sake of uh, clarity, I, I wrote this not in the most performant way. Really, okay. what you would want to do is instantiate that model once. Yeah. Uh, anytime you have new inputs into that model, you would want to bind those inputs, and then you would call evaluation. Okay. So with you, we're not just getting a, a tester, we're getting a performance reviewer as well. Yeah. I, a code review is in my blood. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I just tossed my code over the fence <laughs> to you and away you go. So. I, I feel somewhere back in uh, the University of Western Ontario, my computer science professors are like, oh. Uh, we revoke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, this is really cool. Thank you for uh, showing us this. Now, the MINCE model, this is just an education model, right? It's not a model that anybody can use. So that's why when we did the 7, all this stuff, it wasn't the super most advanced model. Well, so the really important thing about machine learning is the model is only as good as the data and yeah. the training that went in over that data. So this particular model, I think, was trained with a fairly uh, reduced uh, MNIST data set. Uh, so the more data you can actually use in training, the better the results for prediction are going to be. So. That's why in this case, like the seven, sometimes will come out as a two. Awesome. How do I train my own model? Uh, so we have 
actually a couple of solutions around that. You can use Azure Machine Learning, uh, our cloud-based uh, training solution. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some really cool first-party tools that you can use as well. Uh, so those are some ways that you can use Microsoft technology to train a model. And there's other frameworks out there as well that can produce uh, either Onyx uh, directly or produce formats that we can then convert into Onyx. Okay, so you, you, you said that uh, Onyx is like this kind of converged format, but that I'm probably going to be using some for, uh, alternative formats as well. Is there a way for me to take those alternative formats and get my model into the Onyx format so I can use it here? Yeah, so we will actually have a set of tools called WinML tools uh, that will allow you to take a model from various different training frameworks and various different formats and convert them into Onyx. Oh, cool. So what is the call to action for developers now? This is in preview starting today or whenever this video goes out. What, is, what, what do you expect developers to do? So we want developers to pick up our API, start operationalizing models, making some really cool scenarios. And if you guys have feedback, leave comments on our dogs page, uh, you know, start using the code and letting us know what you think of it. Is this like the conversation ball? You can only talk when you've got this in your hand. That's actually a good idea. Um, why are we doing this? <laughs> because we love our jobs. What is our job? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> How are you figuring it out? Uh, by throwing a ball back and forwards.